Um, the other thing that we talked about is last week is just kind of what happens in prayer. And so we talked about how Jesus, when introducing the Lord's Prayer, calls all of us to get away from the crowd, to get away from the people and spend time alone with God. And he said the, what happens when you spend time alone with God is that you are seen and you are heard. So if you feel like you're not being seen or heard by God, then you're probably not finding a place alone to pray with God. But the other result of that we talked about last week that was really important was that when you decide to move, to choose to step away, and pray, and have a place, a discipline in your life where you're in communication with God. And Jesus acknowledges before the Lord's Prayer that this is kind of awkward, that when you get alone, you're speaking to someone you can't see. So when you get away, that, I talked about what happens, is the first thing is that God of the universe tells you that you're valuable. Tells you that you're valuable. And after he tells you that you're valuable, he tells you that if you want to to deal with all of the anxieties in your life and you want to wrestle through all of those things, then you need to seek the of God and not everything else. Really what prayer becomes when you separate yourself is a time of realigning and your your purposes and realigning kind of your vision and mission in life. So that's kind of where we've come. So tonight, I want to talk about how courage and compassion comes out of a life of prayer. And so I'd like to just take a moment. First, I want to tell you a story about like a courageous event in my life. And then I would like you to share events in your life. Okay, So where you've experienced someone else's courage and compassion. And we'll just take a few minutes to do that. I've told this story before, but for me, this story kind of defines who Jesus is and helps me understand what I want to be like. And I think this story kind of illustrates what would happen to us if we were people who got away to pray. So when I was growing up in the third grade, I lived in Globe, Miami, Arizona. So that means if you head on up to Roosevelt Lake, you would maybe pass my house. And the reason I was up there, because you don't go up there unless you're a minor, or your dad is the vice principal of Miami High School. So in third grade, I would ride the bus to and from school. And there was this kid, and I think he's in the fourth or fifth grade, and his name was Chad, and he used to spit on me. But he wouldn't just spit on me, he would spit chew on me. So he's a fourth grader, you know, it's kind of the backwater of Arizona, the fourth graders are two and two. And he was always like antagonizing me and telling me he was going to beat me up. And so one day he said that he really was going to beat me up um, when we got off the bus. So I got off the bus and I guess I wasn't really smart, but I thought, well, when you arrange a fight or somebody arranges it with you, you don't run. I guess you just stay and you wait for the bus to leave and all the adults to go. And then you, you get in this fight. So the bus stops, I get off the bus, he gets off the bus, everybody gets off the bus, the bus leaves, and where we lived there was this hill that goes down and my house was on the bottom of the hill and the bus always stopped in the middle. Now I went back there, I always thought the hill was huge. It's not even a hill, really. But yeah, it was. It must be erosion. But anyway, so there I, there I was, he was higher and I was lower, and I don't even know if I was in any, any kind of stance. He was definitely taller than me. But I knew I was going to get beat up. And then out of nowhere, this kid by the name of Craig, who was a third grader, but he was the biggest third grader, comes flying in and he just hits Chad as hard as he can. And he looks at me and he says, run. And I ran. (laughs) And he got beat up. And I remember going to his house and seeing him. And his face was all puffy. And I told him I was really sorry. And he said it was okay. But that picture for me... As A, a picture of Jesus, what it looks like for Jesus stepping in. But it's also a picture of courage and compassion. And I really want to be Craig. I want to be a person who is knows what to do in the moment, acts with courage, and acts on the behalf of other people. That's what I want to be like. So I just want to pause, and, and if one or two of you 
have any stories of, A, where you were courageous, though I'd rather hear where other people are courageous, but if you want to brag about how you were courageous and compassionate, that's fine. Um, <laughs> any stories of courage that you admire that happened in your life that you want to tell me about? Anything? Yes, sir. Rod, Rod and Kathy. Oh, Rod Kathy, Kathy. Sorry, you said Patty. Yes, Rod and Kathy. You were looking at me. My mom. Yes, Patty. Okay. That what they're going through is, is really great. I mean, to be at the hospital all these hours and to watch your parents be the way she was and struggle with that much pain. Maintaining a positive relationship with God is really great. Yeah, Ron and Kathy, courageous. No, I think you're right. That's that's a good story. Anybody else have any stories in their life? Or like, wow. Yes, sir. Um, well, I was working at Starbucks. Um, one day, I uh, I asked the guy at the store, and he got very upset with me and started threatening me. He told me he was going to stab me. And... Uh, and I was not behind the counter, which is uh, kind of scary. This guy's standing in front of me telling me he's going to stab me. And I stood there and I said, you need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave. And he gradually started moving towards the door and I followed him to the door. And we went out, and out the door and I followed him out on the patio. I said, you need to leave, you need to leave. He stood on the patio, turned around, looked at me, and looked like he was about to come at me. And then turned and walked away. And I was really excited because that didn't happen a lot. And then I turned around and there was a guy who's like six three and ripped. <laughs> <laughs> a sign of courage. <laughs> One more story. Anybody have any moments like that? People you admire where you want to be. I want to be courageous like that. Anyone? Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Go, go for it. <laughs> and uh, a few weeks later, I think she was like, you know, I talked to somebody and I think she was like, you know, she's exploding right now. She's like, yeah, I think she's going to be exploding right now. She's like, um, you know, I'm going to stab your mom. I said, I need to be in the same hospital with you. She said, yeah, you're not going to be in the same hospital with me. I said, I need to be in the same hospital with you. That's definitely courage.
Thank you. So, I think in our culture, in particular as Americans, and as people who follow Jesus, we find ourselves in a place, I think, where it is difficult when we look at, say, a passage like Colossians chapter 3, where Paul tells us that we're supposed to clothe ourselves with kindness and compassion, like that we find it very difficult to do that. We find it very difficult to, to have any courage to know what to do. And it's been my experience in my own life and in talking to all of you and talking about talking to other people that a lot of the time that's because we don't have any clarity. We don't have any clarity. And the reason I think that we don't have any clarity as Americans in particular is for two reasons. Number one is that we are all affluent, which means we're all wealthy. The, the poorest of us in this room is wealthy when it comes to the things. And when we have a lot of things, no matter where we are, when we have a lot of things, it is very difficult for us to risk because we will lose something. Right? It's very difficult because all risks, all acts of courage, all acts of compassion usually put us in a place where we might lose something. And so as people of affluent, me uh, having a lot of things, being affluent, it's difficult for us to do that. It's difficult for us to risk our things. The other thing is that we live in a culture where truth has moved from being absolute to being very subjective. Okay. Let's move from absolute truth to subjective truth. Now, what I mean by that is actually what we've done is decided to talk about everything ad nauseum. We talk about and discuss things about things that were, are right and wrong that people in the past would never dream of, ever even thinking about having that conversation. But let me show you how it sort of infiltrated our culture just by something that just happens normally. And this isn't an infiltration of it, but it's an illustration. When your child learns to read numbers in particular, and they begin to understand that there's a law about driving on the, the road. The law says you drive 35 miles an hour, and they see on that little number thing in front of you these numbers. And they notice very quickly that you are usually going faster right, than that, and they point that out. And they ask, why are you going faster? The law says you should go 35. Why are you breaking the law? Now, my son did this. I suspect some of you did it when you were kids. You've had your own children do that. If your children aren't old enough, they will do it. And most often, this is the explanation that the father or mother gives. Well, let's see. You know, you have to go the speed of the traffic. Well, you have to speed up to pass somebody. And we have all these reasons as to why we should go faster, right? And we begin to explain that to our child. Now, usually black and white children are like, no, it says 35, you're supposed to go 35. Like they, and that's an illustration of where our culture has moved. We've moved to the place where we create these clouds around everything. And so what happens is we become people who have no clarity. We don't know what to do. In fact, when I talk to people, usually the thing that I as a pastor have to talk to people is them saying, I don't know what to do. I don't have any clarity. Like, I don't know what to do in this situation in my life, in my wife's life, in my kid's life, at my work life. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with my addictions. I don't, I don't have any clarity. We've created a, a fog around everything. And so we've become people who are not very courageous and who aren't very compassionate and who don't take very many risks. With that said, I want to read to you a very famous story that Jesus tells. And it's called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Most of you know it. If you don't, you can turn to Luke chapter 10 and we're going to start in verse 25. And I think Jesus kind of unpacked some of this for us. And I kind of want to unpack tonight just a little bit what it's like, like how we can reduce the fog and move and have a sense of clarity about what God is calling us to do and where we need to exercise our courage and take risks. So we're going to start in verse 25. And let me just tell you that 
Jesus is a rabbi who's wandering around teaching and healing. And anytime you have a rabbi in the first century wandering around teaching, you have to have a bunch of experts in the law making sure he's saying the right things. And so you will find many times in the New Testament the experts of the law asking Jesus to explain things. And so this is how the story starts. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, This is the question of all faiths, but it's the question that we want to know. How do I connect my life to God's life? How do I live forever? So Jesus doesn't actually answer him. He says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. Okay, so, so there's, there's the answer. If you want eternal life, then you have to give your entire self to God, and you have to love your neighbor as yourself. That seems really clear. Okay, Only there was a problem, because... The first century wasn't any different than the 21st century. And so neighbor is the problem. Everybody understands giving themselves to God. They, in a, in a, in the Jewish faith, an entire faith built around this particular God, giving yourself to God of the universe, that makes sense. But who's my neighbor? Is the question that's going to be asked. Now, neighbor, the word simply means whoever's closest to you. But within Jewish law, people had decided there was one group that said, well, okay, Really, your neighbor is whoever's ceremonially clean, meaning whoever you can go to temple with, whoever you can worship with, that's your neighbor. Then there was another group of people who were like, no, 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 really, your neighbor is just up to you. You get to decide who your neighbor is. Like, it's your deal. So, this teacher of the law says, all right, we need to get him to answer this. So in verse 29 it says, But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now I think in this question is who you and I are. When we are faced with something that's uncomfortable for us, that's difficult for us to understand, that's going to force us into a place where we might lose something, or we might be inconvenienced, we begin to just ask a lot of questions. Well, who is my neighbor? Well, who really is my wife? I mean, come on. Right? Who are my children? Like, really, do I have to do that? Like, I mean, what is, the the speed limit really is three miles over the speed limit. That's the true speed limit, right? We, we begin to ask questions, and when we begin to question things, we lose a sense of clarity. And so, this teacher's like, alright, well, let's put Jesus on the spot. Let's, let's make him tell us. Now, I want to pause here. The disciples have to be really excited at this moment. They're like, all right, Jesus is going to give us the answer. Like, we've all been wondering who our neighbor is. Jesus is going to tell us. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. And I can, if you just pause for a second and think about this, you can just see the disciples rolling their eyes. They're like, geez, Jesus, come on, man. Like, you're going to tell us a story? Really? You're going to tell us a story? But you know what? Every time you come to the Bible, nine times out of ten, you say, what should I do about this? And the Bible tells you a story. It doesn't change. Jesus tells you a story. Stories are compelling. And so here we have this guy who went down to Jericho and he got robbed. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So the first character that enters into the scene is a priest. Now the priest is the highest guy in the religion. And he walks on by and says he sees him. And he goes to the other side of the road and walks on by. Okay. So the highest guy in the faith decides that the guy in the ditch is not his neighbor. And he walks on by. Verse 32. So to a Levite... When he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. So the second guy. The Levite is the guy who takes care of everything. 
He's the one who makes sure the temple's all right, makes sure all the people are doing what they're supposed to do. So the second muckety-muck of the faith walks on by, sees him, walks to the other side, decides he's not his neighbor. Verse 33, But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Now, if you ever listen to sermons on this or read commentaries on this, the first thing that they're going to tell you is they're going to look at this last part and when Jesus asked him, who's the neighbor? It's very interesting that this teacher of the law can't bring himself to say Samaritan. He says the one who had mercy on him. Now, a Samaritan is the actual neighbor of the Hebrew people. And a Samaritan is a half-Jew, half-breed, basically, mixed with a whole bunch of other people. Right? So they're not pure. And so much, and they're so hated that any Israelite would travel around Samaria to get where he needs to go. If he had to go through Samaria, he's going to travel around because he's not going through there. So when the Samaritan is used in the illustration, the teacher of the law can't even say his name. Can't even say his nationality. He's not going to talk about the Samaritan. He's not going to say it. Okay. But he's willing to acknowledge that the, the Samaritan is the neighbor. I would argue that you and I often do this, is that we walk into people's lives, we walk into our relationships, our marriages, our friendships, parenting, and we see the situation, we see what's going on, and we're like the priest, and we're like the Levite. We kind of move to the other side. Because entering into people's lives Dealing even with our own things, being courageous at any level requires risk and requires clarity. So when the Samaritan sees the man, he's moved with pity. right? He's moved with compassion. And that compassion compels him to take a risk to inconvenience himself, to do something. Right? So here, here's what I want to propose to you. The reason that I, Eric Seepin, the reason that you guys don't struggle with clarity in areas of your life or struggle with courage and compassion in areas of your life is because you aren't stepping away from the busy life and getting alone with God and talking to Him and speaking to Him and interacting with Him. It's not a discipline in your life and that is why you lack clarity, and that is why it is difficult for you to be compassionate and to be courageous and to take a risk. And I would argue in the areas of your life where you're like, I don't know what to do here, I would argue that you're not addressing those areas with God. Now, here's what I want to propose to you, that when you spend time with God alone and you get clarity, what happens is you end up with urgency. You want to act. You're compelled to act when you face things. When you have clarity, you move with urgency, and you're compelled to act. And I want to show you how that works. I want to go to Psalm 139. And I want to show you what happens when you spend time alone praying. Because that's my, I think that's the invitation that God continually is calling to us in Lent is come Spend time with me, and I will offer you these things. And here's how I think clarity gets developed. So Psalm 139, I'm going to read all of it to you, but we'll kind of work our way through it. Psalm 139 goes like this. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, 
You know it completely. O Lord, You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid Your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from Your Spirit? Where can I flee from Your presence? If I go up to heaven, You are there. If I make my bed in the depths, You are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there Your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to You. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is light to You. So what the psalm writer is saying is that God never leaves you alone. God never goes anywhere. He's always there. And you can't escape Him. And He knows what's going on in your life. And so, stepping aside and entering into a conversation with God is acknowledging that reality. Is acknowledging that that is a reality. See, because what happens is most of us spend our time running away from that reality. That God is pursuing us. That God is present with us. That there is no escape. We kind of shut Him off. We put a little compartment in our stomach and we try to shove Him in there and forget about Him. That's why most of us have indigestion. It's Jesus. I just want to make sure you're listening to me. Right? We we try to to push aside the idea that God is there, but He is. And so standing and saying, okay, I'm going to stand alone with you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to create an intimate relationship here. I want you to hear hear me and see me. I want you to speak to me is acknowledging that He actually is pursuing you and that He wants you to be there with Him. Now, here's what happens when you do that. Listen to the, the revelation that the psalmist has. Verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full and well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. When you and I decide to actually pray and step aside and engage God, what happens is we begin to connect to the idea that you and I bear God's image. And when I understand how intimately God is involved in my life and that I am a bearer of His image, I begin to realize that the people that I'm involved with, the people around me, are bearers of God's image. So if you go back to that Good Samaritan parable, what happens is the priest and the Levite don't believe the man in the ditch bears God's image. They pushed it down. The reason that it's hard for you and I to know what to do in each other's lives and to have compassion on one another is because we are so blinded by our affluence and we are so blinded by the fog of who is my neighbor. The fog of, of it. truth is subjective. And it impacts you. Even if you don't think it does, it, it does. You're so, we're so blinded by that. But that. What that does is it squashes the image of God in other people And so our compassion is turned off. Our willingness to risk for other people is turned off. And so my argument is simply this, that when we stop and pray, God will give us clarity, and the clarity is the revelation that we bear His image and the people around us bear His image. And then the second thing is that we get a clear understanding of what is evil. Verse 19. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. 
Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So often, what happens when you and I are going through life and we're faced with the guy in the ditch, when we're faced with our wife, when we're faced with our kids, when we're faced with our husband, when we're faced with people at work, when we're faced with ourselves, what happens is we develop a hatred for all the wrong people and all the wrong things because we're confused. We have no clarity. And therefore, we don't know how to act. So my argument, I'll just it's really simple tonight. I think God is calling the village See, when I, I guess I'll stop here. When I thought, when I prepared this whole sermon series, I thought God was going to call us as a community to get together more and pray. Heck, it's Lent. God must be calling us together to pray. But for the last three weeks, the thing that I think God keeps saying to me is, no, 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 I'm not asking the village to get together and pray. I'm asking the villagers to start praying, to address me and engage me and move out of their busy life. Because if they do, I will give them clarity And out of that clarity, I will develop an urgency. And out of that urgency, I will make the village people who act with courage and compassion. It's really simple tonight. That's, That's really all, that's the message. I want us to be the Samaritan. I want us to be on that road. The road that is, we see what's happening in our wife. We see what's happening in our children. We see what's happening in our co-workers. We see what's happening in our husband's lives. We see what's happening in our neighbor, literally, the people who live next door to us. We see them and we act with compassion. We risk. But the only way we're going to have clarity to do that and know what to do is if we get alone and spend time with God praying. Okay? So that's the invitation very simple tonight. God is calling you to pray alone in a closet somewhere. Just checking. Now, I'm just testing to see if you guys are actually listening to me. Very good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this community. Thank you that when everything's kicking on all the cylinders, it's good. And when everything is chaotic, it's good because you're good. And I celebrate that. And God, I just want to be, I want you to shape us into a community that has clarity, that acts with courage and compassion as it interacts with one another. ask that in your name, Jesus. Amen.